वर्ड्स आर ब्रिजेस शब्द सेतु है अल्फाज दिलों को और इंसानियत को जोड़ने का एक अजीम और तरीन पुल है आखिर हमार मेल संग आखिर हमार जोड़ गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आर फेस्टिवल को डिरेक्टर्स नमिता गोखले एंड विलियम डाल रिम्पल फेस्टिवल प्रोड्यूसर संजॉय रॉय एंड ऑल ऑफ आर सेटिंग वर्क आर्ट्स आई वेलकम यू बैक फॉर आर ऑनलाइन सीरीज वर्ड आर ब्रिजेस Through this series, we aim to highlight the wealth of literature in languages from India and around the world. Our session today is High Winds, Tilotma Mishra and Udayan Mishra in conversation with Urvashi Gutalia. Set in the picturesque town of Shillong, the novel High Wind by Tilotma Mishra is a sensitive portrayal of the separation of Meghalaya and Assam on ethnic and linguistic grounds. woven around the life of a sanskrit scholar and his wife and their journey from the banks of the brahmaputra to the rolling hills the fragility of intercommunity relationships stands exposed the khasi the assamese and the bengali have a shared heritage in shillong but are also deeply divided by certain factors in their history the novel which charts a quest for a humane world was awarded the lumer dai award instituted by the arunachal pradesh literary society and the assam sahitya sabha in 2017 tilotma mishra had her early education in shillong where she obtained a ba with honors in english from calcutta university and ma in english from delhi university and a phd from guwahati university she taught english literature at the indrapas trust college delhi and subsequently joined the department of english dibulgarh university assam from where she retired as a professor in 2007 Udayan Mishra is former professor of English literature and author and social analyst. His publications include The Raj in Fiction, The Periphery Strikes Back, The Transformation of Assamese Identity, India's North East Identity Movement, State and Civil Society and Burden of History. He has been a national fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study Shimla and the Indian Council of Social Science Research. Urvashi Butalia is a feminist writer and publisher. She co-founded Kali for Women, India's first feminist publishing house, and when Kali closed down in 2003, she set up Zuban, a feminist publishing house of which she is now director. She has a long involvement in the women's movement in India and writes and publishes widely on issues related to women and gender. Her best known published work is the award winning history of partition titled The Other Side of Silence Voices from the Partition of India. She is currently completing a new non fiction work on the life of a trans woman. Before we move on to our session we request you all to follow us on our handles JLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to get notified on all our upcoming sessions. in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues you can find us on our youtube channel and on our facebook page ladies and gentlemen we now present hi wings tilotma mishra and udayan mishra in conversation with urvashi butalia hello everybody and welcome to this session i'm going to be talking today to two writers and translators from assam tilotma mishra and udayan mishra were a very unusual uh, couple uh, writers and translators because they both write independently and udayan has translated two of um, tilotama's uh, fiction books uh, an early title called swarnalata which is set in uh, the 19th century and which is the story of three women and now the book that we'll be talking about today high wind which is set in the 20th century in the 70s and which traces the history of um the undivided assam and how it splits uh, and how shillong becomes uh, the capital of the new state meghalaya and it looks at the histories of peoples identities nationalisms and a whole lot more through the story of one family Udayan who has translated uh, the book 
is himself a really well-known academic uh, in the field of literature, having taught at the Brugger University and various other places, and is the author of several books on the Northeast in which he questions the notion of the Northeast and what it means to put so many diverse states together, in which he also looks at the impact of partition on the Northeast, a subject that hasn't been much studied. Uh, and in the middle of all this, um, Udayan has also worked on these two books and translated them. Um, Tilotama herself is also a translator. So she has worked on translating writings on Sita, and we'll come to uh, talk about those a little bit later in the session. So let me turn to both of you and welcome you again and ask you if you could talk a little bit, uh, Tilotama, about your writing in Assamese and the translations that have happened of your work in English by Udayan. Your book, uh, High Wind, Swarna Lata won several awards. High Wind has also won awards um, in, in Assamese. Um, if you could both talk about what it means to be living as you do in two languages, in Assamese and English, you inhabit those worlds, you move from one to the other, you translate from one to the other. So if you could talk a little bit about that in general and in the context of this particular book. Tilotama, would you like to go first? Uh, actually, living in the same space, let me begin with that, because there comes all the difficulty. Uh, for example, Uda and then me, maybe living in the same uh, geographical space, domestic space, professionally, politically. Uh, so a lot of things uh, we tend to share and think similarly, maybe. But there is also a lot of difference. For example, as a writer, I always felt that there's a distinct uh, personality of the writer, which cannot always be merged with that of the um, academic. I have been a teacher and an academic all my life, but I found it uh, very difficult to keep the two personalities, you know, the, me as a writer, I am not a great writer. I have uh, written very few novels, only three. But even then, uh, as an academic person, when I address a particular kind of audience, usually I use English as the language in which I am most familiar with. And uh, I had been educated in, in through English medium throughout my life. As means I have never studied at any level uh, as a language, though it is my mother tongue. But when I started writing my novels, somehow I slipped into Asmis, maybe in order to uh, keep a distance from my other personality, the academic person, which uh, I did, wanted to keep away uh, from uh, interfering with my uh, role as a writer. So when I started writing in Asmis, actually, in the beginning, it was a it was an experiment. I wanted to see how far I can handle my own mother tongue, in which I was never trained. You know, as a as a scholar, I never I was I never passed any examination. Uh, even then, I was very familiar with that language, and yet my language had to be different from the scholarly Asmis, uh, of which I am very afraid. I am not uh, one of the persons who handles scholarly Asmis. Uh, and uh, I'm deficient in that, but uh, I have used my mother tongue as freely as possible at the same time showing various shades of it as it is uh, spoken by different uh, communities within Assam. So that's how I try to keep a difference between uh, though sharing the same, same space, I have tried to keep a distinction between the two roles. But so when you... With. When you think of your fiction, when you're writing your fiction, and when you think of it, you think in Assamese or in your head you're translating, or is it both? Mm. I don't translate in my head, so that's a problem. I think in Assamese, but uh, yes, at certain moments, like when I bring in difficult concepts, I, you know, uh, I think I think through English, naturally. 
But then comes the difficulty of translating it simultaneously. And uh, maybe it goes on in my head. I never consult a dictionary to do that. And uh, sometimes I just do free translation of my thoughts as they come. And you said that you um, don't want to write in the classical assemblies. You don't want to go there. You want to write in a much more accessible language. Um, in a literary atmosphere where the classical and uh, Assam isn't any different from other places in this, where the classical is given so much weightage and where any deviation from it is seen as somehow something a little bit less uh, inferior. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that places you in the canon in Assam? Actually, I was, uh, as I told you in the beginning, I was very, very reluctant even to publish my first novel in Asmir Swarnalata. It just, uh, I never gave it to any publisher thinking that my language is defective. I was not sure about it. And someone told me, my first publisher told me that no one reads a, reads a novel these days in your mother tongue except uh, women from some housewives from suburban town, suburban places. So I was very discouraged. Mm. Anyway, uh, that's why uh, I was very diffident about my language. But when it was finally published, I found that people loved my novel exactly because it is written in a different kind of language. And uh, of course, in translation, it doesn't come true. I have tried to produce the varieties of uh, the language, you know, through different characters, how they handle the language. And I have done a lot of hard work doing that, I think, picking up, trying to read about the different accents, the different, uh, the way you listen to a language, which I have tried to reproduce through my writings. I don't know, people seem to have liked that kind of a, uh, approach. Also, housewives from suburban places are actually amazing readers. Yes. And sometimes they even restore, you know, presidents to their glory or whatever, as has exactly. happened to Trump in America. So we should not, you know, should look at that. I know, exactly. I felt very encouraged the kind of mails I got in those days. Of course, it was all snail mail. I still have preserved those letters, bundles of them, almost fan mail from women from different parts of the state. Let's turn to Uden. Uden, for you, so um, just as um, Tilotama has described that she inhabits these two different identities as teacher, academic, and then fiction writer and tries to keep them apart, your primary identity is that of teacher, academic, that you're translating Tilotama's work, who is so close to you, and she spoke about the difficulty of being in the same space, domestic and geographical. For you, how does it work? Is that a difficulty, challenge, opportunity? So, and what do you do with your academic personality? You leave it behind to enter the space of fiction? Actually, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I have basically been a teacher of English literature. I've loved teaching in English literature. Uh, but at one point of my life, because of, I think, certain social concerns, political concerns, which we share together. I felt that certain things were not very relevant to the type of teaching uh, texts which I do, but I love teaching literature, that's true. It's given an edge to my writings. Uh, but uh, I also started uh, writing about other social issues. And this is where I got involved in uh, so many social movements as well. And that took me to what people call me as a social analyst or whatever it is. So my writings, actually initial writings, I had worked on um, this uh, 19th century British writing on India. My book yeah, has also been published. Part, yeah, that's right. And it was well received also here in abroad. But I gradually moved to writing on issues that were of immediate concern to all of us because Assam in the Northeast was moving to a very difficult times in those days. And there were a lot of assertions of identity at different levels, which had very strong historical reasons. 
but also at the same time uh, there was a lot of fragmentation of social space now and a lot of rise of community passions which i felt you know uh, to be a threat to so many things it's also a threat to creative writing in many ways so that is how i got involved now coming to uh, the two different worlds i think the world of the creative writer is a totally different private world from the world which i have lived in it's been a very different world but uh, i decided to translate these two novels the first novel because i found a lot of things which i thought others should also share a lot of you know concerns about family life community passions about changes about uh, superstitions everything all come so i thought that mm, this is something that needs to be shared and that's the reason i translated this one i i found it to be a uh, competent novel not otherwise the second one of course again uh, i discovered a lot of things which are so relevant to our times especially as someone belonging to this region so i saw found a lot of echoes in the novel and especially the type of very subtle you know presentation of issues related to majoritarian feelings of a community because people don't like to speak about these about nationalism its limits about the whole idea of patriotism which constricts you so much in so many ways and how through one particular character who begins in a very traditional way i am talking of hemavati the central character how very silently without being overtly feminist in any way she ultimately moves through all these different areas and finally ends up in a position which you can call to be broadly humanistic so this is what attracted me and that is why i translated the novel but i am no translator as such i am not at all acquainted uh, with the whole uh, theory of translation as people write tomes on it i don't know how people do but i don't know how how you can get into it i translated it because i like the novel and i would like to translate other novels also uh, if i get the time by other writers but uh, apart from that i think uh, for a translator it is the sense of involvement that is more important and as far as the power of language or the the nuances a lot of nuances naturally get lost but in this case in high wind i think we are both of us are very fortunate in having such a capable editor in you and urvashi you have given it also a different type of a flavor making it much more readable so i am very thankful and to them also to you for doing it thank you that's really nice of you but let me go back to um, so there's a curiosity that readers often have about uh, the relationship between translators and uh, writers and especially as you say when you're located within the same domestic space so how did it work when you were doing it did you have lots of conversations about it did you talk across the dinner table and say what did you mean by this passage or did you not communicate at all or was it a, what was the process I, i i don't think there was a lot of communication especially you know only a few points sometimes i used to you ask her about certain words but i did it without thinking of uh, the writer i never thought you know that i would get help from the writer in translating it but basically i think it was you might say you know in a cliche term a labor of love for me which uh, turned out to be the translator and as tilotoma said just as she didn't have any formal training in assamese i at least she studied i think up to class 2 or 3 in assamese i never studied assamese at any level in school or at any level at all whatever i learned of assamese is through at home and primarily through my efforts through reading of newspapers and i had to read all the local newspapers initially thoroughly because i also used to write on social issues so that is what took me and naturally i think i am a bit competent in the language now because i also edited a 
Assamese journal for many years, a left wing journal. So that way, I think the mother tongue comes in. But one point that Tilotama made, which I would like to reiterate here, is that the spoken language, if it is spoken correctly at home, I think is a great advantage to both the translator and to the writer. If it is spoken correctly, more or less correctly at home. And that, I think that advantage both of us had in our homes. Okay, Tilotama, so would you uh, now like to tell us a little bit of what High Wind is about, where it locates itself? I gave that one line summary, but that's not in any way adequate. So just uh, in brief, how would you as writer describe what your novel is about? Well, uh, I don't know, when I started writing that novel, uh, I tried to uh, sort of critique or try to introspect, you know, the various um, issues, problems encountered by three generations of my own family settled in Shillong, because in those days, Shillong was the colonial capital of Assam for 100 years from 1873, I think, to 1972. So lots of Asmi's families like my own, my father, my grandfather, they had all settled in Shillong. And they had created, you know, in a way, small islands of their own, each community. As I grew up, I always felt that each of us, whether you are Bengali, Asmi's, Khasi, Anglo-Indian, you know, there are many various communities there, and they all grew up in their own communities. And at some time in our uh, life, we started rejecting, you know, many of the prejudices, many of the um, uh, views, uh, beliefs of our own communities. And we started critiquing them when we started, when we mixed with other communities and found that the world is very different from what we grew up in. So in that way, Shillong was a great learning place. You know, it is a place which had a magic of its own. It transformed our personalities. In a way, I feel my book is like a, a kind of a um, history of Shillong in a way, because it shows the transformation of the place through the transformation of the different communities, how the communities started um, overcoming barriers and boundaries and how there was intermixing in various ways, culturally and otherwise through intermarriage also, and how the new generation that is there in Shillong now has inherited so many of these ideas that it has bonded them in a different way. I have tried to show that in the last chapter of my book. It begins with the first chapter, ends with that at the end, that it's a kind of bonding which we have, I have seen it, experienced it in my own life. And uh, I feel very deeply about it. Like today, when I go back to Shillong, I, none of the people I knew in my childhood days are there anymore. Everyone has moved on. They have migrated to other places after the uh, shifting of the capital from Shillong to Guwahati. All the Asmis people, most of them have uh, gone off to other places. So even then, when I go back, I feel, you know, that um, magic of Shillong, it is still there in all its trees, in, in the nature, and in the new generation, which has inherited the music, the culture, the dances. There was so much of uh, exchange, interchange of ideas that I, I feel totally indebted to my birthplace, though it is uh, now a very different place. In fact, you both talked about this and Uden referred to it also a few minutes back about how um, the rise of uh, identity politics in uh, and the region in some ways has led to um, a positive articulation of certain kinds of marginalized identities, but has also led to a kind of almost uh, ethno-nationalism, right-wing intolerance, which uh, as uh, Udayan said a minute ago, also hampers the creative process. So there is, that must be quite a disturbing thing to, to watch um, happening in, in your own um, neighborhood. Would either of you like to comment on that? 
or me or Uday? Either you choose, because you both talked about it. So, Urvashi, well, actually, uh, I, I I don't want to go into the historical reasons for the coming up of identity politics. There was a lot of Asvi's hegemony after '47, and there was a lot of insensitivity on the part of the new rulers, you can, if I use the word rulers, or the new set of people who are running the government. Now, all these contributed naturally uh, to the uh, unhappiness of the marginalized classes or communities or sub-nationalities, small nationalities. I prefer to call them the small nationalities. Now, assertion of the small nationalities is a historical process in the Northeast. And uh, I think it, it has brought us there a lot of positive elements, as you have suggested. But ultimately, you know, when you come down to the brass tacks, you know, the process of uh, the assertion, uh, in most cases, the process of the assertion uh, releases a lot of community passions. And it is in the release of these community passions which invade our universities, our institutions, where the freedom of speech or the more important, the freedom of thought, the right to think, which is so so very cardinal to creative writing. That gets affected. And apart from that, you know, you move away from um, just, I, I, I sometimes feel that high wind is also a sort of a wish fulfillment. You know, that this was so nice. It may have had its hindrances, but you know, it's nice to believe that everyone, you know, interacted with everyone else. There were no, no barriers. Different types of barriers were there, but not the type of barriers which you see now. So with the rise of uh, ethnic nationalism in the entire region, I'm not talking of any particular nationality. I think uh, the first casualty is uh, inclusive social space. You don't have, you know, you don't, you don't believe in that inclusive social. The, the, the me and you become very important, the they, the outsider and the insider becomes very important. And that, I think, has been a major casualty uh, in the Northeast. Now, when I reflect back, because most of my writings are also related to identity politics, how it has happened. But uh, when I look back now and I feel, you know, that uh, the world is constricted in many ways. On other sides, you know, it has opened up in other ways. But uh, I think we have also lost a lot and uh, how to make up for the lots and how to, you know, uh, give that freedom of thought and expression even to people who are more or less, you know, uh, I don't want to use second class citizens, but citizens who have been, you know, deprived of many of their rights as per the constitution. So now when I look back in this, growing old now, so I can look back and think, I think, uh, Yes, uh, a lot, lot has been lost, that's why. And the whole idea of fragmentation and the denial of citizens' rights to uh, thousands of people in what we call ethnic homelands, this has come. And this is a reality which uh, neither the government nor the majority communities are prepared to tackle. They always, you know, try to shy it off. So that is the sad part of the story, I feel. That is the sad part, you're right, yeah. So, Nutama, would you like to add, yeah? Yeah, you had also mentioned uh, that about the inner line, concept of the inner line. Now the inner line and the outer line, you know, they now become the key issue in whole of Northeast. Everyone is asking for inner line, but I feel, you know, it is a line through your heart, sort of inner lines, uh, in a way they protect communities and they are meant to protect but at the same time they exclude others so drastically that uh, it's become a very very sensitive issue. Dilutma, can I uh, request you, I have lots of other questions but uh, before we move on can I request you to read a bit from your book a passage in Assamese and if Uden might read the English of that. Okay. Be nice for uh, listeners to get a sense of the language. I'll just read, I think, because uh, I have it in hand, uh, the last part from my 
Kame uh, Karkor, which is now the English translation is High Wind. Kame uh, Karkor, the name itself, it's uh, actually it's a pun, you know, Kame sometimes people may confuse it with Kamakya, you know, and uh, there are scholars who have said that Kamakya is actually related to uh, an old Khasi goddess, maybe, Kamekha. But it also means the grandmother's house, Kamekhar Khor. So I'll end with, the, I'll read a passage from the last part of the book, which I think brings in many of the issues. Hitor Kukan Dinbur Pasat Aku Bokhantor Agamon, High Windor Homukor Pulonikonot, Ezelia Dujupat, Hari Hari, Hakuboronia Pul, Puliutise, Jarkali Borof Puri Hukaijua Gahunikon, Punor Hiosia Kainred Hakitorise, Artar Majamaja Pulise, Hajar Hajar Halotia Dandelian, Hunamune Halotia Pulbur Singi Singi, Okonmani Paru Hatot Gujidise, Nancy Hotetai. Ketia bag tin to Babe high window to a jay. Parwe Urifura Dandelino Kumol Tulabur Toribolo, Kahoni Upor Deodi Purise. Taik the Kihunamon or Monopore Labano Brahma Polit Utipahito Hua, Kihotor Kuikobor Din Brolo. He Dinbur are he Manubur Etiaru de Kibole Puanajai. Besibat Puroni Korote and Nutun Bahinda. Puroni Manu Karabak Lokpale, Karkor to Pune Kinile, Hedwe Buhu Alusuna Sole. Logaloke Hunamon or Montu, Egg Bihad or Pavia Son no Kuritulen. Hunamon or Monorabosta Ovasetia, Horho Bihadre in Horpur, April Mahotai, Biahobolege, Logore Bankor, Hohokormi, Ponkoj Gupter Hute, Arbia Pastota, Shilong Eri Jabgo di Brugorode, Ponkoj or Itimote transfer Hubese, Tayu di Brugorle, Budoliba Babedon Kuise, Huyamor e Protombar Babe Tai Tokake Jabo. Shilong Eri Jor Kotab Habile, Diamond to be had a repore, Totapi, he pap to a tie hopun bull, Venus to Kuribo Paranai. February Mahor, him hitol, Botajake, High Wind or Sohoto, Horol Gospur, Majere, Ekro Hoshomoi, Arunya Hongitor, Lahor to Lijai. Goimo Ponchoti Tor, Honi Kutatur, Kiriki Framor Majere, Hodai de Kapua, Howly Toka, a cold Korea Horol Gospur, Dal Patpur. What a hot punor and do it a whole tis. Horote gossipale sai babe, Manhor jibon to tick any quay. Barabare to Muhai Kubai Gulu, Nizos Sahon Jiboni hop tire, Manhe punor punhoi, Tiodibopare. I think it's just one page. Yeah, it, it's a really nice uh, feel of the sound. Uden. I'll read bits here and then I'll go off to the last part. <coughs> Spring had finally arrived. After the long dry winter months, the two azalea bushes in the garden of Highway were now in full bloom with dazzling deep pink flowers. The grass in the lawn, which had dried up because of the winter frost, was now once again green with hundreds of dandelions in bloom. Sonamon was plucking the small yellow flowers and placing them in the little hands of she was bought at home. Move on to another part. February strong winds <clears throat> rushed through the tall pine trees of high wind, creating a mysterious music of their own. The branches of the tall, solitary, and slightly bent pine tree, which was which was visible from the window of Ponchatitra's bedroom, were once again swaying violently in the strong wind. Sorat often looked at the tree and found similarities with it when it came to facing the challenges of his life. Like so many others, the tree too, too had withstood all the storms of life and continued to stand firm and erect. It was after several days that Sorot once again opened the lid of the old piano. As he ran his fingers over the keyboard, he tried to listen to the music of nature outside. The kikadas from the pine trees were heralding the event of evening with their continuous five-fold tunes, creating a strange resonance. And from deep within the woods, wood, sorry, and from deep within the woods came the mysterious two-fold call of the hill cuckoo, which always reminded Sorot 
of Wordsworth. He suddenly started playing from memory, a cheerful piece from Vivaldi's Four Seasons. At first, in a low key, somewhat uncertainly. Then he opened his music book and started playing to his heart's content. Every wall of high wind resounded with Vivaldi's composition. The entire house coming back to life at the touch of the vibrant notes. Is that too? Thank you. That's beautiful. And actually, it's perfect because it leads me to a question I wanted to ask you both, uh, which is about music. Because um, this passage that you read is so musical and it ends with the actual music of playing. Um, but you've spoken about how, um, about music as a kind of uniting factor, about music reaching out much beyond the communities. And I think you spoke about Bhupen Hazarika's music and how uh, it, it was owned by so many different people. So um, can you talk a little bit about the sense of art and music being able to reach across community boundaries? And what that means? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I'll begin until the world yes. take up. Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, again, you know, when you talk of the Northeast, you talk also of violence, mm -hmm. a lot of community strife. And uh, our experience has been, you know, right from the 50s onwards when we were much younger, that during such moments, uh, music plays a very binding force. I'll start with the Indian People's Theatres Association, the IPTA. Uh, when, uh, whenever trouble started, especially up to the 1960s, when we had the language riots and so on, you know, the uh, fight over the Assamese language to be made the official language, which I feel was the beginning of so many other problems. But anyway, uh, when there were quite violent riots in the plains of Assam, uh, I think it was Bhopan Hazarika and his IPTA group led by Hemango Biswas and others. They toured the entire Brahmaputra Valley singing. And it is their singing, their songs. Some of the best Bhopan Hazarika songs were written at that time. And I think it brought a lot of succor to people. I don't know how far it unites, but it at least, you know, calms down a lot of passions. So similarly, in other periods also, we have seen music being very important as a, as a binding force. And even in Meghalaya now, I think music uh, brings the people of Meghalaya and Assam very closer. So they have rock festivals, but uh, the Shillong, Shillong Symphony, which is quite famous throughout the world, Shillong Choir, which is quite famous throughout the world. They have sung the Assamese National Anthem in a superb manner. So it's 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 a it's a bridge, as you said, in our program. It's a it's a very important bridge that continues to exist between different areas of the northeastern region, and I hope it'll it'll be further strengthened in the years to come. That's what I feel. Hello, uh, Yes, you're right about Shillong. Shillong is the place we always associate with music right from childhood we have seen that in every house if you go out in the evening some strain of music will be heard whether it is piano western music or um, indian classical you know bengali localities if you go through that you'll be hearing classical music or rabindra shangit so we grew up literally it's a small town but there were varieties of musical performance in Shillong. People like Hemango Vishas, Udoin has talked about, Hupen Hazurika, they sort of began their career in a way in Shillong. The audience was always the huge audience. Ne never, you never lacked an audience. And today, of course, you have Majao and uh, all these you know, Shillong choir and all the pop groups. They never lack, a, lack an audience because it is a place for music, we always felt. And uh, it cannot help but come into the pages of the book because it is so much a part of life in Shillong. The varieties of music and uh, just a part of the school syllabus also. Everywhere music was taught and people sang and danced. So I think I brought in a bit of that into the novel. 
it's a part yeah. of yeah, that's lovely. I didn't realize it was part of the syllabus as well, uh, singing, dancing. You're right, because when you think back, you see it all the time. Okay, a uh, last word, um, Tilotama, very quickly. We have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your work on Sita? Okay, uh, that's the uh, it's again a translation, but it's a very different kind of translation from what I have done till now. And I'm quite I have full of trepidation about it because uh, I've taken up a work um, which is uh, which has not been done by people till now, um, at least in our part of the country. It's a text, you know, uh, a 14th century vernacular Ramayana rendered into Asmis by uh, a poet, Asmis poet Madhav Kanduli. And, and also uh, there's a part of it, the Uttarakhanda is by so I found that the representation of Sita in this vernacular version is very different from that in the Valmiki version or the other uh, vernacular versions of the uh, epic. That's why I found, I thought it is necessary to translate parts of the uh, text. I mean, I'm not capable of doing the whole of it. I have made selections where Sita's voice comes through. So I have called it Sita's voice in the Asmis Ramayana. And she speaks in a uh, language and in a uh, tone very different, I feel, from the Valmiki Sita. And uh, that's why I have tried to highlight that particular representation of Sita in the Asmis version of the epic. And uh, in my introduction, I have tried to probe into this whole matter. Why is it? What sociocultural uh, compulsions may have been there because it was patronized by a local tribal king, uh, Varahi Kachari king, who commissioned this Brahmin poet to translate the book into um, Asmis, though he himself probably could never read and write in that language. But the whole thing was orally represented. You know, Madhav Kanduli translated it and he read it out to the king. And in the text itself, he has often brought in it that the king is listening while I'm relating this. So what was the compulsion of having the, that epic translated into a remote area, you can say, of the Brahmaputra Valley? And why, was the, uh, why, was, uh, why were the characters, both Rama, Sita, and others, represented in a particular manner, which was closer to the local uh, in people, uh, the language of the local people, their uh, expressions, their uh, idioms, which have been very nicely sort of portrayed through the language of the characters. So I have tried to, uh, as far as possible, I have tried to translate and uh, represent uh, in my own way uh, Sita's voice in the Asmi's Ramayana through my English translation. But I don't know how far I have been successful. I'm waiting for the response from readers. I'm sure it will be wonderful. Thank you both very, very much uh, for Thank speaking you. to us. It's been lovely talking to you. I've learned Thank a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. As Tilotma said, music does bring us together and bridges differences. Thank you Tilotma, Udayan and Urvashi for that wonderful session. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. If you've enjoyed the session, please do share with your friends, family and on your social media pages. We will be back next week with a new session on Jaipur Literature Festival's Words Are Bridges. Have a lovely evening.